I was one of the founding members along with Carl Wickstrom and others. And Carl Wickstrom's uh, son is here. Blair Wickstrom is one of our board members and founding the Florida Sportsman Magazine. But years ago, we had to form this coalition because at that time, at that year, there was up to 7,000 cubic feet a second coming through here. Not 500 like there is now, but 7,000 CFS. And that year, uh, the year after, we held a big rally out here just like this. We had uh, literally 900 people out here. We had the mist was so strong that the guys on the cameras were wiping their lenses off because the mist from the discharges was so strong. Many of you who've been here for a while remember that. Many of you remember how bad these discharges can get. But when it's like this and there's no discharges or minimum, we say that's the way it should be. <laughs> we don't, the St. Lucie doesn't need it. We want to stop the discharges, no discharges from Lake Okeechobee. We have enough problems in our own watershed to take care of to clean up our waters, but we need to send this water south. And you know, the south is where it needs to go. Yep, we need to send it south. And uh, right now, you know, we're, we're, we're for 60 days, these past 60 days from Jan, uh, January 22nd, when the Corps decided we need to lower the lake. We got caught, remember last year with Hurricane Ian came across, dumped about 25 inches of rain in the watershed and it all came down into Lake Okeechobee and the lake went up to 16 and a half feet from 12 and a half feet. So that's four feet jump. And then they had to get caught with that lake really high during the, going into the dry season. And they're trying to get it down for the wet season back into better for Lake Okeechobee, but also in preparation for June 1st for the preparation for our tropical storm season. So that's the way the schedule usually goes. And they're working on a schedule of Lores 2008 that was the last time the Corps had a, a, a revised schedule for the lake of when, how, when and how much they discharge east and west and put south in order to keep the lake in a balance. And that uh, schedule right now only calls for about 400 CFS to the Clusatchee and 200 CFS to us. But we're getting 500 CFS to the St. Lucie and 2,000 CFS to the Clusatchee. Now what does that mean? That, that's about 1.6 billion gallons a day. And what's happened over these 60 days or so is 96 billion gallons have been discharged to the Atlantic Ocean or Gulf of Mexico. And we're saying that water should be going south to recharge the Biscayne Aquifer. And there's 340, uh, 340 million gallons a day that's used uh, by the Miami-Dade uh, utility. So they're basically have about 300 days of, of of water supply that's been discharged to the Atlantic and Gulf and is not going south to recharge the Biscayne, which is right in the middle of, of the Everglades. The Everglades needs the water this time too. It's dry. It's gone down and they need that hydrology to continue even through the dry season. So the new schedule they're working on, LOSOM, is about to come through fruition this year. Hopefully we'll get it signed soon. There's some other hang-ups with reviews and stuff, but we're hopefully we'll get the new schedule. And in the new schedule, it calls for zero discharges during that management band of the St. Louis to the St. Lucie. Zero discharges, which is what we're all in favor of. And, and only minimum discharges over to the Caloosahatchee on the West Coast, non-harmful discharge. So and putting the rest of that water south is the real key, the real key to this whole thing. So I'm gonna, we're gonna have a line up here, some speakers. Um, we're gonna start out with uh, a, new, a new person on the block, so to say. We have a new Brigadier General on the South Atlantic Division, um, uh, General Heibner, and he's gonna be coming up to speak, but I'm gonna get uh, Lieutenant Colonel Polk is with us to introduce him. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Polk's been around for a while. Many of you have seen him. Thank you, Colonel, for being here. Um, Colonel James Booth is not with us today. We, he sends his apologies, but he's on, 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 DC, right he's on DC duty right now, so we have to have him up there. And then I'm going to uh, also ask uh, Jackie Thurlipish, who showed, uh, has come out from the South Florida Water Management District, to follow up from the Colonel, and then we'll get going. So thank you, Colonel Pope. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Appreciate it as always. Uh, so much knowledge and history, and, and, and couldn't do it here without you. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Oh, all right, I'll take it. Hey, so I'll just give a kind of quick update on what you see and why you're seeing it, and uh, you know what's going on and, and what you see today and why we're here. Um, 
And I'll introduce um, my boss's boss, so our, our senior command, my commanding general in Atlanta, who we're fortunate to have down here right now. So again, Lieutenant General Todd Polk, the deputy commander for South Florida. I think most of you all see me here. You know, I have family that lives right here along the coast as well, or along the, the uh, canal as well. Um, so right now, our Lake Sydney, we're at 14.81 as of today, right? So it's like, like, like Dr. Perry said, that's coming down. We've been receding almost a foot uh, in the last 30 days, uh, which is you know, remarkable. We also expect this time of year with a lot of the evapotranspiration. And as you said, our, our, our plan is still to remain about 500 cubic feet per second coming this direction and around 2,000 cubic feet per second going going to the west of Lusahatchee. And today you see we're closed uh, because why? We, we, we've got to maintain navigation in, in the canal. And so when the canals, are, uh, we try to keep it at 14 feet. We're sitting around 13.6 and 13.5 this morning. So, hey, we, we need to fill it up. And that's because, again, the, the water's being pulled south for water utilities and agricultural purposes and municipal purposes. So. Uh, again, we, we, as you know, have a very delicate balance. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about low sum there and, and under low sum, we're trying to make sure that we enter into the first year of low sum in a period. Um, we won't have to look at a recovery period, but we may have to do uh, higher volume releases, right? So that's, that's, that is the, exactly the goal. Sitting in the south, you know, with, with bringing projects online and, and as we just, just uh, broke ground on the EA reservoir, right? That's what's gonna get us in that direction. Um, so with that, I, I do wanna introduce uh, General Dan Hittner here, he is, he again, our, our commander in Atlanta and, and uh, ultimately you know, the one who will, will sign off on the Loson process. So with that. Hey, thanks, Todd. I, I want to thank everybody for being here. It's really a great turnout. And, uh, and uh, I've got, I'm no stranger to the Corps of Engineers. I spent three years in New Orleans District when I was a captain and a major. I'm from the neighborhood, so to speak. I was the Savannah District Commander from 2018 to 2021. And, um, and I'm lucky to be here, not just today, because I'm lucky to be here today, but I'm lucky to be in this position. Uh, I was the, the Commandant of the U.S. Army Engineer School before here. And, uh, and G General Jason Kelly, many of you probably may know, or at least may be familiar with, was reassigned, went down to Fort Jackson, and we're lucky to have him there. And um, and I'm filling his big shoes. I've done it before in Afghanistan. I've done it as a captain. We've got history together. And uh, I really am lucky to be here and to be a part of this this regional mission that we have. And our region uh, is, is encompassed by North Carolina. It wraps all the way around the southeast into eastern Mississippi. And we do a ton of water management throughout the entire area. I, I, I will say, as important as all our projects are, I want to acknowledge the importance of this area. Southern Florida, Lake Okeechobee, Kissimmee Chain of Lakes. And I was uh, fortunate or unfortunate enough to see it within just a couple weeks of my taking command after the hurricanes came. And I found myself in South Florida. I found myself in a flood fight in Osceola County in the, in the, in the, the north part of the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes where incredible people are making an incredible difference in partnership with the south florida water management district saving people's homes um, but to get a glimpse of why all of this is so important back then is is really what is resonating with me now as i'm spending an entire week learning the the, the, the system knowing before but now better appreciating that we have a national treasure here down in South Florida, you know, all of the water resources that come from it, the economic benefits that come from proper water management, the tourism, all of that to me speaks about national security. Without a vital, a vi a vi the vitality of our uh, economic resources, and that starts with preservation of our natural resources, uh, we start losing national security. And, um, and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of that. I'm, I'm really excited to see where we go in the future with so many great initiatives happening, lots of great planning projects that are already in motion, projects that are well in motion throughout this area. Um, it, it couldn't be a better time. And I, and I couldn't be more happy to be here with you all today. And I started talking about the great turnout we have. I'm really happy to see folks here. I'm glad to see your signs, LJ Sucks and everything else. And we want to hear about our dolphin neighbors because we can, we can talk about each other 
from wherever we go. But until we get together, we start talking with each other, we're really never going to get to a better place. So thank you for being here to help us get to a better place. Thank you. Thank you, General. Appreciate it. Um, you know, he says a lot um, to get for him to be here today and to, to commit some time to help, help us understand. Uh, next on the agenda is not on your agenda, but I'd like to bring up first uh, is Jackie Thurl Lippish from the Governing Board of the South Florida Water Management District. Give it up for Jackie. She's awesome. She's part of us. She's been a part of our coalition and helping us out and understanding stuff for many, many years as many of us have, so Jackie. Thank you very much. Hello everybody, Jackie Thurlow Lippish, River Warrior, now on the South Florida Water Management District. Amazing things have happened during our time advocating for our beautiful St. Lucie River. 99 years she has been connected to Lake Okeechobee and taken the hard discharges more than any other water body. Next year will be 100 years. I have gone through so much of the historical data with the help of the Army Corps of Engineers as I sit on the district board. And I can tell you that as hard as things are, we have and are making tremendous progress. And most of that progress is because of the Army Corps of Engineers. And I, I know it's hard, but I'd like you to give them a round of applause because I am telling you the culture is changing. We know that in 2013, 2016, and 2018, we had ecological disasters on our hands here. Just this year, and yes, we are taking the 500 CFS, which we do not want, but Colonel Booth had, has three times stopped those discharges because he was uncomfortable with the visual algae that was seen. That has never happened before. Thank you, Colonel Booth. To have the general here today, General Hibner, this is unbelievable. When I talked to the district, they said, Jackie, there has never been someone of that level at a Rivers Coalition meeting. We are breaking down barriers. We are communicating. We are going to get through this. I want to thank the Army Corps on behalf of the South Florida Water Management District we are your local sponsor in SERP. More has happened in the past four years than has ever happened before with these projects. But we know it is not just projects that are going to change the health of the St. Lucie River. It is relationships and a different culture of what we expect for clean water in the state of Florida. Please give a round of applause for the general here today. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jackie. Yes, as she said, it's, uh, it's, there's a lot has been done. There's a lot of work to be done. And that's why it's great to have that cooperative effort with the, with the Corps and the district happening together. And all of our inputs coming to them as well. Um, they're listening. And I think that's really important. Over the years that we've been involved in this for so many years, it's been a struggle. It's been frustrating because the core has their ideas, the district has their ideas, everybody had their own way of doing things. And we were kept telling them and pointing out, we need to change, we need to change it, this system. And so finally, as Jackie said, it's not just about the projects that are coming online and waiting for the billions of dollars we've got to spend to fix things. It's also about the operational aspects. And that's where the core comes in. We built this new schedule up to have that more flexibility. So hopefully after LOSUM gets adopted, we'll have that flexibility within the schedule that the core and the district can manage the, the lake in a lot better fashion than ever before been managed. And then we can get the water right, not only for the Kissimmee and the lake, but also for the Everglades, 
the estuaries, everything in Florida that depends on that water. Now in Martin County here, since we're in Martin County, they've done a lot over the years. If you've lived here just a short time or a long time in Martin County, you know how much Martin County really cares about our waterways. And we've got a representative of our county commissioner, Sarah Hurd, come on up. She's going to say a few words about how Martin County's involvement in the deal. Thanks for coming today, Sarah. Appreciate it. Thank you. I've been doing this way too long. Uh, I've been attending these river rallies for 20 years. I was just telling somebody about 15 years ago, I attended a river rally right over there and drove like everybody else did. It took me two hours to get onto Canner Highway. That's how many people were here. 5,000 people showed up with two days notice in order to protest for the benefit of the river. And also I want to add on to Jackie's uh, praise we are so happy to have you here, General Hipner. We really are. Uh, I want to sing the praises of the Army Corps of Engineers. They have spent hundreds of millions of dollars in Martin County in order to improve water quality here. We have the, the C44 project that's completed. We have the C23 and 24 project underway. Uh, the general flew over yesterday. He's driving over there today to see the project off of Sneed Road in, in uh, St. Lucie County. So the Corps is, 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 our, is our partner and they're doing a bang up job executing the projects of Indian River Lagoon South. And for that, we are very grateful. The reason that we rally here is because of these structures. This, these harmful discharges that are uh, that come here, they enter the Indian River Lagoon, and the Indian River Lagoon was the most biodiverse estuary in North America. It was the most productive marine nursery in North America. It's the, the, the best the nursery for marine life all along the Atlantic seaboard. And it is a seagrass desert now because of discharges from Lake Okeechobee. So now we know that we have an operation, uh, a schedule that doesn't work. We've known for decade, a decade that it doesn't work. So we've spent the last over three, three years uh, modeling, using our best science, using our best math, in order to create a new operating manual, a new operating schedule for the, the Lake Okeechobee management. So now we have an arbitrary date for the new LOSM to take, uh, to take effect. We need to stop the excuses. We need to stop the loopholes. We need to stop the discharges. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. We have some commissioners from the uh, city of Stewart. Um, is Campbell Rich here or is Chris Collins here? Maybe they couldn't. Chris Collins made it. Commissioner Collins, have a welcome up. City of Stewart, right down the river. So unlike Commissioner Hurd, I am new. I have not been in this position for a long time, and so I still consider myself a normal person. And I am here for the same reason that you are here. It's been a hundred years. I don't have any relationships with the Army Corps. I don't have their cell phone number and go out to dinner with them. I can't ingratiate with how amazing they are. I appreciate what you guys are doing, but until it's easier, until it can't go east, it's never gonna go south. Until the city of Stewart, and I'm gonna speak for myself, I can't speak, there's five other people that are on that commission that have their own uh, opinions too. We're not one unified front on what to do, but my viewpoint is until the city of Stewart, who has a unique position, being a peninsula that's wrapped around by this river on three sides, sues the Army Corps of Engineers and says, you can't dump on us anymore. It's never gonna end. We're two years into Lowsome now, and all I hear is that this is not really what Lowsom would do. It would be different. But I see a process that it's gone all over the, the, the lake to every single stakeholder that's gotten everybody's opinion. And as far as I can tell, when you have that much politics going on, it would be impossible for us to not get discharges because it wouldn't be fair. So, again, speaking for myself, not for the city of Stewart in general, I want to see the city of Stewart, and I hope that you all will coax our commissioners because I think we're in a unique position to fight for the 
health, the quality of life, the property values, the ability of rec to recreate. Uh, and like I said from the dais, until people can fish out of this river and not have to worry about getting sick, they can swim without having to worry about getting strange infections or God knows what's in that water, it's not enough. I'm not going to stop. So please encourage your Stewart City Commissioners, not the county, the Stewart City Commissioners, when you get a chance, lovingly, and uh, you know, not angry. We're all trying to do a good job to help, but encourage them to pursue. We have a unique moment right now in the city of Stewart where our uh, city attorney previously has moved over to city manager, so we have a vacancy. And I want to see an environmental attorney with litigation experience in that role. I don't think the Army Corps particularly cares. They are uh, plumbers, no offense. <laughs> they get sued all the time. It's up to the city to defend its interests. And I know the county works tirelessly, but the county has the Western Ag interest. It's never gonna happen. It has to be the city of Stewart. So please encourage your commissioners. I'm one of them. You have another one here as well. I don't know if Campbell's here, but please encourage us to fight for you, to fight for this whole area as a whole, so thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, we do have another Commissioner here from Stewart, Becky Bruner. Becky Bruner, give it up for her. Woo! Becky has been here for probably longer than I have, too. My parents moved here in 1957, so growing up in this area, Becky, you want to come up and say a word? Come on, come on. She. She's had been a champion for this river even before she got on the commission, obviously, but she's known it like I've known it. And back in the day when the water was clear, you could see bottom at Roosevelt Bridge, you could see fish. We never worried about algae or bacteria blooms or algae blooms. We never thought about those things. But when I came back in 78, I go, oh my gosh, look at what's going on. So Becky, thank you for coming. I just want to say a few words. I was. Um, I am glad you're here, General. Um, if we don't get your help and try to work things out, and I believe Jackie would stand behind me for this. You just heard her speak. And we've been coming out here for 10 years now. And it, and it, it can get so depressing. But we keep going and we keep going and we keep going. Mark, for over 40 years he's been doing this and keep putting that seagrass in and putting those oysters down every damn year. And so I didn't mean to get emotional because um, the commissioner, I sure don't want to make this political. Not at all. We need your help. You know we need your help. And I am looking forward to when Losom gets here. I know that it's been changed from June to... Uh, Later. We don't know. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, I'm happy to see all these people here. A lot of you have gone through this with us. And uh, sometimes I feel like I don't do enough. And if I thought, then maybe we might need a lawsuit. But I don't think that now. I want to, um, I, I just want to be happy and grateful that you're here. We never thought two years ago that Jackie, that we'd get a governor that fired every damn one of them and put in some of the best people that were environmentalists and scientists and Jackie. Um, and then we kept doing more. Our governor come here, I think he's been here two or three times. I apologize, it is, it is very emotional. But I do want to thank you for being here. It, it is good, and I want to I want to use the words I guess of Sir Winston Churchill, and he, that's to all of us who've been here for many years, and those of us who are just starting. And that is never, 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 never give up. You never give up on this cause. You fight for it year after year, no matter how long it takes, how frustrating we get how depressed we get about this, you gotta keep fighting. If you don't, you give up and walk away. People say, oh, well, I guess you just, that's what you do. You just give up and walk away and let somebody else do it. 
no, we've got to fight for this cause. And this, and it'll happen someday, may not in our generation, but we've got to pass the baton for the next generation to run the rest of the relay race. And you know, it's up to media like this that's here today to, to help get the word out. And they've been doing a stellar job. Our local media has been doing great. And give it up for them. I, I appreciate them coming. And, and one of our media who, who writes about stories and has this outdoor sense has been with us for a long, long time, and he does a great job. And I want to bring Ed Killer. Come on up and say some words, would you, Ed? Bring up Ed Killer. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, you can take that mic off. Or you can point it off. That's all right. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Sure. All right. Okay. Uh, Blair asked me to come to this month's uh, Rivers Coalition meeting to give you all a little bit of historical perspective. And with all due respect to the core, which, by the way, I always make a joke that when you say with all due respect, the next thing out of your mouth is not, not respectful at all. <laughs> anyway, with all due respect, um, I want to I wanna read some words to you, and then I'm going to tell you where they came from, okay? <clears throat> this is called The Green Plague Was Overlooked. And it's really about hyacinth problems out in Lake Okeechobee many, many years ago. But... Uh, it, it actually speaks about how the water and how, like Chris Collins said, how the plumbing works in, in Lake Okeechobee and this entire system. So one of the contributing factors to the decision to open the St. Lucie Canal and pour a muddy flood down on us was the fact that lands and roads on the west shore of Lake Okeechobee were inundated. We, we have a vast engineering setup to control the waters of the Everglades with millions of dollars being spent on long-range plans to do this and do that in the future. Yet today, we see tragedy. Farmers and cattlemen ruined because no one had the foresight to pull the corks out of the canals and creeks that flow into Lake Okeechobee all along its western shore. Martin County has the right, has the right to wonder. Once more, our coastal waters are being ravaged. Huge oyster beds in our river, just now approaching maturity, are being silted in. Thick layers of silt are being deposited on the bottoms of all our bays. A million dollar resort industry is threatened. Commercial fisheries face ruin. If we are being made the scapegoat for bad planning in the Everglades, that is a doubling of inefficiency and a compounding of making two victims where there was one. We are struck by the fact that there have been reams upon reams of surveys grandiose plan after grandiose plan advance, but all that has ever been done in the way of getting water off Lake Okeechobee has been to widen and deepen St. Lucie Canal to put it into our laps faster than before. The canals leading from the lake through the Everglades that still have a, a hump in the middle, have never been widened and deepened to pull excess water to West Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, and Miami. While Old Stewart takes it on the chin every time there is a, another mistake in the Everglades, there has always been doubt the St. Lucie Canal effectively lowered Lake Okeechobee. A few weeks of sunshine take more water off the 1,600 square miles of the lake than this narrow artery on the East Rim. But there's a psychological factor entailed. It's easier to pull the plug in St. Lucie Canal to assure flooded farmers, ranchers, and townspeople that everything's being done that can be done than it is to have a genuine flood control system, a system with more than, more than one outlet, and a system which works in an emergency. Any flood control system will work when there aren't any floods around. The Everglades system has never worked when a flood showed up. Now, those were words that were written Ernie Lyons. by Ernie Lyons. And they were, wait till I tell you the date here. For those of you who don't know, it was from October 11th, 1951 and there's an editorial in the Stewart News. It's 1951 y'all. That's like 73 years ago, 72 years ago. So this isn't a new problem at all. In fact, there's cemeteries full of river advocates just like yourselves that have fought hard their whole lives to keep our waters clean and have been failed. No, no disrespect to the Army Corps of Engineers because the military leaders get changed out every three years. And the civilians are only there like 10, 15 years, maybe, for a career, and then they move on to retirement. 
So there's, there's no, they have nothing at stake here. We're the only people that have something at stake, us and the people in Fort Myers. I'm gonna read one more thing to you real quick. By the way, let me tell you about Ernie Lyons. He was as good as, a, he was a better fisherman than he was a newspaper man. In fact, I probably can't even carry his tackle box. So uh, just so you know, he saw the problems with the St. Lucie Canal, Lake Okeechobee, and the St. Lucie River from the eyes of a fisherman and an outdoorsman. And that's what made his writing so beautiful and so, so appropriate for the problems that we, we face. <clears throat> this is from February 16, 1950, about a year before he wrote that other piece. A still small voice, the spirit of a town. That was a column he wrote weekly. Back then the Sewer News was a weekly. And he would write this column that ran. It was just random thoughts a lot of times. Sometimes it'd be about life in the small town. Sometimes it'd be about bridges. Sometimes it'd be about Christmas, you know, be whatever. But this time he wrote about the river. Its golden years were from the 1890s to the 1920s. Although persons living here did not know it then. Our wonderful river was clean and pure, unpolluted, so loaded with fish that their jumping sounded like the roar of thunder at night. Huge tarpon coursed in schools in broad St. Lucie Bay. Sea trout, bluefish, and sheep's head were abundant in the heart of the town. The tragic part of Stewart's story began with the money craze of the 1920s, and we took the first steps to make the St. Lucie River a sewer for Lake Okeechobee. Our river was raped and ruined by deluges of mud from Lake Okeechobee. And this is what I have in closing. We have lost something that was so deeply loved, our river. To those who knew it as it used to be, it is today but a shadow, a dead thing, muddy and polluted. Our spirit was tied closer than we knew to the river. That was 1950. 73 years ago he wrote that. It's like he's walking among us now. So let's fix this, okay? That's great stories. And if you, you haven't read any of Ernie Lyons' books, I recommend you do. Go to the Stuart Feed Center downtown and check out all the old photos and the, and the history of that. I met Ernie Lyons a couple of times that when I first came back in 78 before he passed, but he was quite a guy. And when I look back at that record, December 15th of 1951, the Martin County Commission passed a resolution that went forward to the Internal Improvement Trust Fund and told them we got to stop these discharges because they're killing our river. And we have copies of that available too. I mean, this does go way back, like Ed said, way back in history and time. So now we're gonna hear from a couple of uh, our, our Art Rivers Coalition organizations that are with us. I want to get up Jim Moyer from the Indian River Keeper. Jim, come on up. Indian River Keeper, thank you for the tents and some other things that we've done. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Mark. You know, it's, uh, it's a real honor to be among heroes, and there are many of mine here. Thank you, the Army Corps, for, uh, for doing your best. Unfortunately, it's not good enough, and you can't stop now. The state needs to do a better job of reducing the nutrient inputs into our, our waterways. Um, we cannot allow this to just be standard operating procedure and just kick the ball down the road again. It's time to stop martyring the St. Lucie River. The St. Lucie River is part of the treasure that makes the Treasure Coast. The diversity of this lagoon is what keeps us alive. It keeps us alive economically, it keeps us alive physically. It's got to stop being the cesspool for operations that are protecting giant agricultural interests. The agricultural interests in this state have ruled the coast for as long as the state's been producing agriculture. The system is broken. The DEP is not doing its job. It's pointing fingers at the Department of Agriculture. The Department of Agriculture is pointing fingers back at the DEP. We are stuck in the middle and it's time it stops. It's time that the agencies at the state level get a backbone and do what they say they're gonna do. It's time that we, as a voting public, do what we can do to stop them from doing what they have done to our natural systems. It is time to stop acquiescing to 
big money and and development that is probably the final agricultural crop on all of these fields. The Army Corps must protect the, the environmental systems in order to protect the economic systems. It's got to be their priority. The idea that we can delay the adoption of Lowsome many more months to prove that we're killing other wildlife with discharges is obscene. It cannot stand. The idea that we need more proof that toxic algal blooms are killing the environment is preposterous. It is evident everywhere you go. We lost 2,000 sea cows to demonstrate that our seagrasses are gone. To continue discharges when the seagrasses are wiped out in the St. Lucie estuary is insulting, and it must end. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That's awesome. Um, you know, we are connected to a greater system. The greater Everglades ecosystem goes from the upper chain of lakes south of Orlando that feed into Lake Kissimmee and the whole Kissimmee Valley that used to wind and meander down a 105 mile long river to the lake took about six or eight months. There was a two mile wide floodplain. So when it got real wet, it flooded out to the floodplain and then narrowed up. And then when the lake flowed south, it overflowed its southern banks and that slow flowing river about 30 miles wide and 100 miles long was only about a foot and a half deep and it went one mile every four days and that was aptly described by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas back in 1948 in her book The Everglades River of Grass. We're fortunate now to have our friends of the Everglades here and represented at this at this body by Eve Samples. Eve come on up a long time champion of the system too. Thank you, Mark. Eve Samples, I'm Executive Director of Friends of the Everglades, um, but I've also been involved in this cause for too many years, like too many of us here. And one thing I was reflecting on as I'm, I'm listening to everyone speak is that Stuart always shows up. We're not getting massive discharges out the gates today. In fact, we're not getting any discharges just because they've been temporarily closed. But all of you are here because you're aware of what's happening. You track this issue, you care about this issue, you know that this is more than an environmental issue. This is a public health threat. So Ed mentioned some writings from Ernie Lyons from 1951. Not enough has changed since then, but one thing has changed. We know a lot more about the public health risk posed by toxic blue-green algae blooms. We know that microcystin in blue-green algae is linked to neurodegenerative diseases such as ALS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. We know it can cause respiratory ailments. And those of us who were here during the last summer of 2013 and protested right across the river here, the canal here, remember that we couldn't even let our kids touch the water that summer. My son was four years old during the last summer of 2013. He couldn't go to summer camp that put him in contact with the water that summer. They had to do indoor activities. So this is what we've been living with, not just in 2013, 2016, and 2018 as well. There is a solution, there are solutions, and we've made some progress, at least on paper. We're on track to have a better Lake Okeechobee management plan, LOSUM. It's better, it's far from perfect, but it does take into account the effects of toxic algae. Unfortunately, as some have mentioned, that lake plan has been delayed about six months. We're grateful that the Army Corps of Engineers is demonstrating more flexibility in closing the gates when there's toxic algae present. But this problem will not be solved until the St. Lucie River gets zero water from Lake Okeechobee. We never need it. We never need those gates from the, from the lake open. And the solution, globally speaking, and we at Friends of the Everglades think in terms of the big picture, is the same for the St. Lucie Estuary, the Caloosahatchee Estuary, and the Southern Everglades in Florida Bay. That's to send more clean water south. And until we have a lake plan, and that's just not just the responsibility of the Army Corps of Engineers, it's also the state and the South Florida Water Management District. Until we have a lake plan that recognizes those needs and stops treating Lake Okeechobee like the personal reservoir of big sugar, none of that is going to change. So thank you for being here. This is our wake up call. The lake is very high for this time of year. This could be a bad spring and summer, so let's all stay involved. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. That's great. Um, next up, we've got uh, Gil Smart going to come up. Uh, Gil is just 
recently he's been involved with uh, Vote Water, which is uh, a great group of showing us who's voting for what and how the votes really count in our political system and how that means a lot for our water resources. Gil, come on up. Thank you. I want to uh, reference something that Jackie Thurlow Lippish said when she was up here, and she talked about the need for a cultural change. It's true that there's all sorts of momentum in terms of Everglades restoration projects. Uh, this week alone, uh, the House, Senate, and uh, uh, the House and the Senate up in Tallahassee released their budgetary proposals. Uh, looks like they're going to exceed the $1.1 billion Governor DeSantis has asked for in terms of water quality programs this year, and that's great. It's going to mean all sorts of money for the Everglades, for Everglades restoration projects. That's fantastic. It's going to mean millions of dollars uh, for the Indian River, the new Indian River Lagoon Protection Program. That's fine. Unfortunately, there seems to be this idea that if we throw money at the problem, it's going to solve the problem, and that's not going to happen until we change the culture. Because even as our legislature is talking about these big numbers, they're considering bills which frankly are going to result in more nutrients in our waterways, which is going to cause us more problems like the blue-green algae we've seen here. There are numerous proposals up in Tallahassee uh, that would basically give a, a, a green light or a bigger green light to sprawl and would result in less citizen involvement, would result in quicker turnaround times on building permits and things like that, and ultimately it's going to result in more pavement, more runoff, more nutrients in the water. And the same legislators who are touting this money that they're going to you know be voting for for these environmental programs are voting for new laws like these because the culture hasn't changed when you talk about how the system here operates the culture we may have new relationships with folks from the core which is fantastic and as i understand it those relationships never existed before it's fantastic that those relationships do exist now it's valuable it's valuable to be able to talk to folks like the people who are running the show at the core about what's happening here. At the same time, though, what Eve just said is correct. The system that we have is operated primarily for the benefit of big agriculture and big sugar south of the lake. Until our values change, our culture changes, and the system is not operated in a manner that prioritizes their interests, we are going to have to come back here to these locks as many times as it takes. I want to point out that Florida Oceanographic Society, Mark's outfit, just put out a white paper a couple weeks ago talking about why can't big agriculture keep their runoff on their own land and treat it on their own land instead of sending it on to the stormwater treatment areas south of the lake. Okay? If you come to our meetings, you've heard Mark talk about this many times, but this white paper actually articulated a lot of what all this would involve. And what it would involve is a lot more room in those STAs for water from the lake so we wouldn't have to have discharges. Okay? Now, there are legal protections in place for the agricultural industry that don't make this so easy. It sounds like a no-brainer. They would fight it tooth and nail, of course, and there's laws in place and they get certain legal privileges. But again, this goes back to the whole idea of a culture change. We need to change the way the system operates because, frankly, the way the system operates now is not only inequitable, it's immoral. And until that changes, we're going to have to keep coming back here. So that's the change we need. Thank you. Way to go, Gil. You know, years ago, uh, several years ago, when the River Coalition was already kind of going, there were two girls that kind of got together and they were real concerned about this. And they went down on the corner of the street and they started selling lemonade and started, you know, showing signs and saying, hey, we got to stop the, you know, discharges that are killing our river. And it started a whole movement that Jackie Thurl Lippish and her family folks and everybody got together on and that is the river kids and the river kids got to be connected big time with us and now many of the river kids are older kids okay so they're growing up but i want to get the river kids up here and have some words from them but come on up everybody come on up even if you don't want to say anything or speak i want you to come on up and say something First off, I want to say thank you to everyone who's gathered here today. To me, um, it's really important to see everyone here, especially the younger generation. Um, I've lived here, obviously, my entire life, and when I was four years old, I joined this group 
because I was aware of how horrible it was to live in an ecosystem that was constantly collapsing. Uh, this photo is the summer of 2013, where I was five years old and I couldn't even swim in the water because it was infested with algae that would give me diseases. In fact, it was so bad that it was killing all the fish and even dogs. I find it so important to keep the flow in Okeechobee and I need, I just, it's so sad to see everything collapsing now and you know, my hand is shaking because you know, I'm new at this whole public speaking thing. Um, but seeing all this death around me and it's just, it's so depressing. It's hard to stay happy anymore when all I can see is pain. The animals are starving. They can't even like breathe anymore because of how bad it is. I hope that the words that I've said today feel something in your heart to change. Thank you. This needs to stop. Give it up for the River Kids, come on. There are hundreds more like this out there, so believe me, believe me. Thank you guys for coming, so appreciate it. Took off the school. I mean, they're, yeah, they're in school, a lot of them, but thanks for getting them out of there and bringing them over. That's awesome. You know, it's, it's this generation, it's like Eve Sample said, and when we grow up here and then we come back and our kids can't swim in the water, it, it really gets you. You know, I have to tell my daughter and their, her daughter and say, you can't, I'm sorry, you can't swim in there. I used to, I used to catfish and swim and, and eat the shellfish, everything was fine. But here's just one generation later, I've got to tell them that they can't go touch the water. They can't get near it, they might get sick. That's just not right, it's got to change. All right, so we've got to hear from a couple of anglers too. I don't think Ed Stout, is Ed here? Ed, Ed is a um, South River Outfitters. He's a kayak guy that uh, has been around for a long time and has helped the cause. Uh, he he had, unfortunately has to open his retail store and stay in business. But um, I think we have another angler here too. Is, is Aaron here? Yes. Aaron, come on up. Aaron, yes, come on up from Florida Sports. An angler that intense about it. How you doing? Good. Hey guys, how you doing? My name is um, Aaron Benzrehem. I actually was born and raised on the West Coast, so I've seen this um, absolute deterioration of our ecosystems on both ends, and I went to Sanibel School from kindergarten to eighth grade. I've been fishing my whole life. I come from generations of fishermen. My dad was a fisherman, grandfather. I write for the Florida Sports Magazine. I've written for other publishments and publications, and uh, I'm also a content creator who is very passionate about fishing. I'm 29 years old and in my short lifetime I've, I've seen the deterioration of the fishing and the ecosystems at large and I just remember being a kid in Sanibel Island trying to go out to the beaches and there would be signs that the beaches were closed, the water was contaminated, the smell throughout the entire island because it's a small island if you've ever been there when there was really bad toxic algae blooms that made their way out into the Gulf of Mexico it was absolutely horrifying and horrible to see the things that I saw just growing up, dead manatees, dead dolphins, dead fish, kind of put something in my heart to want to try and advocate for a better future. And I just had, you know, twin girls and I think about, are they going to be dealing with the same issues that we're dealing with? And as I listened to everybody speak, what spoke to me most were the articles from 1950 and 1951. I mean, the fact that it's been 73 years, and it seems like we're hamsters running on a wheel trying to get something done is very frustrating and from an angler's perspective i think a lot of us that are out there that are outdoorsmen that are constantly fishing constantly on the water we see it firsthand and i think it's hard to develop compassion and empathy towards things when you're not there you know seeing it smelling it and living it the deterioration of just fish species I've been fishing Martin County and St. Lucie County for 11 years. I met my beautiful wife here. 
and her family's been here their whole lives and I've been fishing with them since then and I've lived here five years now and just in the short time I've been fishing here it's just gone it's gotten worse and worse and worse and worse and sometimes I feel like we see the light on both coasts the Calusa and the St. Lucie and we start to get a breath of fresh air like oh my goodness things are getting a little better I can actually see the bottom a little bit there's more abundant fish species and populations and then boom you get hit with something and immediately deteriorates the water quality goes out the door the water clarity goes out the door and the ecosystem starts to just get disrupted immediately and I think what needs to happen is for people from the younger generation like myself Millennials and Gen Z need to start to pick up the cause and also help because with all the money going everywhere I still feel like hamsters running on a wheel and I think somebody said it best I forgot who but I think it needs to be a cultural shift where more and more people are aware and more and more people are involved and I think that the power of social media has actually helped fuel that with these supercharged red tide and toxic algae blooms that we've seen on the west coast recently in St. Pete and Tampa some of the videos have gone viral and have generated millions and millions and millions of views and I think when you start to have a cause that grows from the local community statewide to even nationwide that's when things are going to start to change because nobody likes to see you know packs of dead manatees in a cove that are floating upside down it's absolutely horrific and if you haven't been there for the smell it's absolutely disgusting and I think that as we continue to shift towards pushing this into a bigger cultural issue then we might start to see some change but as somebody who's been fishing my entire life I mean I've, I've seen it just deteriorate deteriorate and like I said the graph seems to go like this but it continues to get down so even though we see that little bit of shift where things do start to get better for a month maybe a year eventually it ultimately just continues to get a little bit worse so I don't know if there's hope, uh, being here today and seeing the turnout, I think there is, and listening to a lot of the older people who have been you know, at this for far longer than I've even been alive, it's really inspiring to see. And I hope that the younger generation can you know, start to band together as well, and I hope that we can utilize the power of social media and influence to bring more awareness to everything that's going on, because it's not right, and it's just not fair to all the animals and the estuaries. So thank you so much, guys. Like, you know, when we look at the gates here and they're closed, we say to everybody, it should be like this. This is the way we shouldn't have any discharges. And when we look out there to the river, and sometimes we haven't had discharges for a while, it gets cleaned up, and you can see bottom, and you can see where there used to be seagrass or where there was oyster reefs, and you can see a few fish. That's what we need to tell people. That's what it should be like. And, you know, the estuary is pretty resilient. And it'll come back and it'll, if we stop the pollution and we stop the discharges and we stop the pollution coming into this system and dredge out the muck and get rid of it as part of the New River Lagoon South plan, it'll start clearing up on its own. But we have to stop that pollution from coming into the system. We have to stop it all the way up the watershed, wherever the watershed is to bring it into the system, including this stopping these discharges, we have to stop it. And we will see the mullet jumping again. I it was encouraged the other day when I saw a mullet jumping in Palm City Bay out here, and it was like, wow, the mullet are jumping. That must be, it's gonna be good, it's okay. You know, they have a theory that mullet jump to kind of maybe get the parasites off, but or they jump because of this and that, but nobody really knows. A lot of the theory is they jump because they can, and it's fun, and that's why they jump. And they may be jumping to get away from predators, no, don't, no doubt. I mean, you see a bunch of them scattering out. But every once in a while, you'll just see the mullet jump, and you'll go, wow, you must be happy. So let's see the mullet jump again, right? Let's get the mullet jumping. All right, we, we're going to open it up for a little, uh, anybody has a comment or want to say a few words, just a real brief uh, comment, you come on up and we can, we can share some time. We've got uh, Nick Mater here from, hey, Nick. Hi, I'm Nick Mater, and I am with River Kids, but I'm also with Dolphin Ecology Project. So I've been serving the, dol the bottlenose dolphins in the southern Indian River Lagoon for the past 11 years. And so I did hear General Hibner talk about the dolphins, and thank you for bringing them up. Um, if you look over there, um, over in the corner, it says, get to know your dolphin neighbors, and what about us? So those are individual, real dolphins that live here in our river that don't go anywhere. They may travel 50 miles here or there, but they don't go out in the ocean. That's another stock 
Our dolphins are our dolphins, and what we do to this river, we do to them, not to mention the manatees, the turtles, the sharks, the rays. But dolphins are intelligent, beautiful mammals that live in this river, and we should really respect them also. It's not just about us. And also, I wanted to say, yes, we need to stop the pollution and the discharges, but I'm sorry, we need to stop overdeveloping this area. And we also need to look at the boats on the river. There are so many boats registered in Martin County, and I think we need to do something about that. They're just all over the place, everywhere, and these poor animals that live in the river don't stand a chance. So just think about all that, and our county and city commissioners, please, please think about those kind of things, along with keeping some of the areas of Martin County really pristine and special, because that's what we're all about, and that's why we all live here. Thank you. Ready to go, Nick. And, and the Rivers Coalition, we do have some uh, stickers and information and bumper stickers and things that back there, along with uh, uh, the River Kids and other information back here. Also, if you haven't signed a petition for the right to clean water, uh, that's a, a, a proposed constitutional amendment for Florida Constitution. I think Diane's back there for with those petitions back there in the back. So please see her and uh, let's get that on the ballot so people can decide if we have the right to clean water or not. So we want to say another word. Jackie has another word. Come on up. Thank you. I wanted to keep this uh, separate because it's business. So at the last governing board meeting, um, I had requested that the Army Corps of Engineers and the South Florida Water Management Districts, they call it a conditions report, an algae conditions report at S308 could be made public. And I wanted to let everybody know that the, that the, the district with uh, the Army Corps uh, is working on that. And uh, it will hopefully be uh, a mechanism such as like with the DEP Blue Green Algae page, where you can go up and pull it off the page. And this will hopefully be within, I'd say, realistically a month. And I kept thinking, hopefully by then, we won't even have to deal with this in a month. But in any case, the Army Corps has been, they have been getting the people who are in their, uh, operation centers to, to stand on the side of the levee and take a picture of the gates and, to see if there's algae there. Now this, this, again, these are the little things that are the cultural shift that didn't used to happen. Well, they've been happening. And then they send those pictures to the South Florida Water Management District and the South Florida Water Management District sends their people and their scientists and they test it and then send it to DEP. And this has been a new thing that they're doing. Well, this will be public information. Uh, it's been public, but it's just been through emails. And this again is, I mean, things are changing. We're gonna do it. Thank you. All right, we, we do have a, come on up. We have a, uh, you know, observations are really key. You all out in the community, you all fishing or even observing anything, whether it's an algae bloom, is really key. Uh, years ago, we took pictures of the plume coming out of the inlet over the near shore reefs, which is a real problem. But Jackie and her husband, Ed, have flown over the site for, for years now and on take these observations and these pictures. And those pictures speak more than a thousand words, especially to agencies, and cause them to take action to do something. So keep observant. That's really key. And keep communicating your observations. Come on up. Hi, I'm Rick Hall, a river warrior, a member of the Rivers Coalition. Rivers Coalition since uh, 2011. 2011. And uh, I moved here mainly because I had a back infection. I wanted to be outdoors. I'm a water baby. I love the water. I moved here. And one month later, I could walk two miles where I couldn't walk 10 steps. And I said, well, I'm going to start fishing. And I went over under the, under the bridge. Ever cast, you caught something. I didn't know what it was, so I threw it back. But one month later, the water went brown. 
and I didn't know why. And I just happened to be there when they were giving an award. And I asked, well, what's going on? Oh, they're releasing the water from Lake O. Kind of pissed me off, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good story. Great stories. All right, all right we have another, another public comment. Great. Hi, my name is Mary Starzynski. I'm a public citizen, retired physician. In regard to the water, in regard to excessive sprawl, I just, I'm just going to read this as mostly paraphrased from someone just got from Don Mills, or in regard to the Rural Lifestyle Amendment. Sorry, I was getting nervous when I start speaking. Yeah, sorry. Um, in regard to the, uh, the Rural Lifestyle Amendment, it was litigated by Don Meltzer, as, as you may know. So the ruling just found, just came out recently, found the amendment not in compliance with our Mark County Comprehensive Plan. The rural lifestyle, therefore, is not the law as of now. That is a win today for Martin County residents and the Martin County difference. But we have to work to convert that ruling to a permanent long-term win. Um, sorry. As adopted, as currently adopted, the Comp Plan Rural Lifestyle Amendment opens the floodgates for sprawl by smashing the urban boundary. The judge's order, with any exceptions the parties file, will go to the cabinet for a final order is just expected in May. As we know, as you may know, the cabinet is, uh, we don't even, it's very partisan, unfortunately now, environment is partisan. Republicans are voting against it. Democrats are voting for it. Richard Nixon was a, a staunch Republican who, who gave us the Clean Water Act and Clean Air error because he didn't want to be bested by JFK's legacy. So let's all work together fast for a county fix so developers cannot walk around, walk around our comprehensive plan urban boundary protections. Martin County residents are already upset about this area. So the Martin County Conservation Alliance will be in touch soon with some recommendations. If we don't do something, uh, three of our commissioners are sure they were going to vote for against this amendment. One of them lied. That's not acceptable to me because I don't lie. So sorry to be emotional, but please be aware of this. This will extraordinarily open our urban boundary and the um, excessive land that is provided in this will be mostly golf courses and be, be full of fertilizer and discharges and will make things a lot worse. Thank you. Thank you. All these, all the issues are combined. It's, it's our lifestyle here in this county and we're very fortunate to have a good comp plan that Many years ago, back in 1980, when I worked with the coastal management section of the plan and everything, we put in things about, you know, four-story highland. We put in things about, you know, preserving these environments and activities, and they're still holding fast today. But each time if a commission comes aboard and they have different views and they want to change things, they have that opportunity to amend the comprehensive plan. So we have to always be diligent year after year. Basically, we've got to move this water south. When you look at this map of Florida, you can see that south of the lake where it used to flow, okay? But it's got, it's got, when we built that dike around Lake Okeechobee and finished it in 1937, because there was so much flooding around, it killed many, a thousand, 2,500 people lost their lives. We diked that lake and stopped that flow of the river grass south of the lake. But we've got to restore that. And there was hope years ago when um, some of the U.S. Sugar Corporation wanted to sell and divest 189,000 acres and divest, there was hope. And we looked like, wow, maybe this could really happen. We could restore the flow. But a couple years later, they said, oh, well, we changed our mind. We really don't want to. And there was this option to buy and the economy went south. But hey, you know, we've got to have some due diligence to say we want to restore that flow south to the Everglades and stop it from damaging discharges eastward to the estuaries and the Indian River Lagoon and west to the Caloosahatchee. That water needs to go south and come down to the 10,000 islands where it used to be. There's not enough water going south in some of the years between the Keys and, and, and the tip of Florida. Florida Bay is one of the world's largest seagrass beds and we had destroyed about 50,000 acres because it got hyper saline. That means too much salinity. So the ocean is about 35 parts per thousand. It went up to 85 parts per thousand. And when it did that, it killed the seagrass. And it basically, all the seagrass dying here is because there's not enough flow 
through here, constant flow. And that flow even during the dry season. So right now, this water conservation area, Remnant Everglades, is about a foot below where it should be. And that's why we need to get that water south instead of putting it east and west. But there's some roadblocks here. There's not only agricultural lands who, as we said, uses that basin runoff to the STAs. The STAs are overloaded and they can't take this water going south. So every time Corps schedule says send it south, the district says, well, wait a minute, the STAs are not in good shape to do that. But pretty soon we've got to meet that water quality standard to send this south and get that water flowing. So we've got to keep diligent and keep fighting for that. And, uh, you know, whatever your land uses are, we're not against agriculture. You just got to do it sustainably. And you got to do whatever you're doing on your land or your land use, you have to do it sustainably for the environment. You have to retain and detain that water on your own property before you allow polluted water to run off into the Everglades or the estuaries or anywhere else. Same responsibility right here. These engineers in the water district, they have that responsibility now to help manage that water correctly. Not just for flood protection so that everybody doesn't get flooded, but also to go you know, for the environment to improve that uh, water flow and work with nature rather than working against nature. We realize now that these natural systems provide us so much in, in ecosystem services, clean air, clean water, things we can live on and, and, and enjoy, and, and the reason why people move here, right? So if you're all pro-growth, you want growth, you better be about clean water and clean, clean air. So let's all uh, conclude today. We're going to say something. First of all, Mark has been carrying this same poster around for 40 years. So let's all thank Mark for all of the hard work he's put in at Florida Oceanographic and at the Rivers Coalition. Thank you, Mark.